Um, welcome. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Tom Leonard from TPI, and uh, the subject today is privacy. What is the what is the way forward? We have a great panel to discuss that issue. Uh, the subject of privacy legislation has been has been on the congressional agenda for probably 20 years now, and has uh, has always kind of failed to to quite gain enough traction to make it uh, make it over the hump. But a lot of people are saying that uh, that this year is different, and that two, 2019 is going to be the year, uh, finally, the year that uh, privacy legislation. Uh, passes and several things have changed. For one thing, um, uh, there have been fairly stringent uh, privacy regimes enacted in Europe and uh, and California and other states. And people, people, some people think that we are falling behind the rest of the world. Um, in addition, uh, Silicon Valley is really under under scrutiny uh, as never before due to a variety of problems, including uh, well-publicized uh, data breaches. And all these factors are kind of causing the tech industry, privacy advocates, politicians uh, uh, across the spectrum uh, increasingly uh, to come together in favor of some form of uh, privacy legislation, uh, although, I've, although the devil will, will certainly be in the details. So we really have, a, I'm really pleased with the group that we have to discuss this issue. This issue. They are all uh, very well recognized experts on, on this area. I'll briefly introduce them. And we're gonna, we're gonna go, this is gonna be informal. Uh, we're, I'm gonna start out by asking questions. And then at a certain point, I'm gonna throw it open to the, uh, to, to the audience for your questions. Um, Going down the row, uh, uh, our first panelist is uh, Maureen Olhausen, uh, who has just recently uh, joined uh, the law firm of, uh, of Baker Botts uh, as a partner. Uh, and uh, she, uh, she was most recently, as I'm sure all of you know, acting chairman and for a number of years commissioner at the Federal Trade Commission. Rosalind Layton is uh, a visiting scholar at uh, the American Enterprise Institute and also a visiting researcher at Alberg University Center of Communication, Media, and Information Technologies and vice president of Str at Strand Consult, both in Denmark. Alan Rawl is the founder and leader of Sidley Austin's uh, privacy and cybersecurity practice, uh, formerly was vice chairman of the White House Privacy and Civil Liber Liber Liberties Oversight Board, among other. Uh, government positions, and Abigail Slater is uh, special assistant to the president for technology, telecom, and cyber policy at the White House National Economic Council, where I think she's uh, the point person on technology issues, including privacy. And uh, previously, she was general counsel at the Internet Association, and also spent ten years uh, at the FTC. Part of that time as uh, as an advisor to to Commissioner Julie Brill. So um, I, I'd like to start out by asking the panelists, and maybe we can kind of start with Maureen and go and go uh, down the road. Um, do we need a federal privacy law? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Uh, well, thanks, Tom. Thanks, thanks for having me. I think it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think a lot depends on what that federal privacy law would look like. For a number of years, the FTC had recommended a breach, uh, a data security and breach notification uh, statute. Uh, the commission had thought that could be useful, give the FTC some additional tools, uh, the ability to impose penalties on companies uh, for the initial breach, not just uh, if they violate an order. So the question now is arising, do we need a broader privacy statute? Um, and I think there's a lot of people saying, yes, yes, we do. We, we have concerns. But um, an important thing is what would that look like and what would it add in addition to what the FTC has already been able to do under Section 5 of the FTC Act, which is to go after deception and then unfair practices. Um, so I think there's some questions, what would that bill look like? What kind of powers would it give and to whom? 
uh, if it was to strengthen some of the FTC's enforcement abilities, what would that what would that look like? Would they give the FTC rulemaking authority to uh, a APA rulemaking authority? Would they give them civil penalties? Would they get rid of the common carrier exception? I mean, I think there, there's a lot of questions to be answered. Uh, and one other thing that I think is, you know, needs to be, be kept in mind is a lot of this debate is being driven about concerns by the tech companies. But any privacy bill would hit a lot more broadly, would hit almost any industry in the U.S., because almost every company now is a data company. I was talking to some entities recently who you would, wouldn't think of being, you know, in, in the tech space, but they have a lot of information about their employees, about their contractors, about their customers. And these kinds of, um, you know, changes to the privacy law would hit companies like that as well. So I think those are the kinds of issues that Congress is going to have to wrestle with if it does want to move forward with a general privacy law. Now, there is, I will say, for the first time, the FTC commissioners in recent testimony said that on a bipartisan basis they would support privacy legislation, but they said it's really up to Congress to make the policy cuts on what that would look like. Beyond data breach legislation. Beyond data breach, right. Yeah. Roslyn? Yes, yeah, so th thank you again, Tom, for the invitation, and <clears throat> Happy New Year to everyone. It's wonderful to see so many faces and have a chance for this substantive discussion. And so, well, just personally, I, I certainly support a single standard, <clears throat> and this is driven in part by what's going on globally and, and in, our, in our country with various states making up their own privacy rules, and certainly to, as, as Maureen was saying, you know, we have different uh, industries with different standards, so the patchwork is a problem. Uh, but what I would say is, in fact, it's not really a new idea at all. Going back to our founding, our uh, Madison and Hamilton and the Federalist Papers were talking about how important a single national economic marketplace, how important that was. And that was really our idea with the Internet. And it's something that um, Europeans, Europe wasn't able to enjoy, even today, with their efforts for a single mar digital single market, you still have uh, 20 languages, 17 currencies, and we take for granted how valuable, how how um, <coughs> how advantaged we are in the United States by having a common language and currency. And now we're threatening to uh, break up that seamlessness if every state is going to invent their own their own standard. So uh, I think it's an important time that we we talk about it. And you said the discussion's gone on long. But it's been, a, it's been a substantive discussion. It's bipartisan. I know if you turn on the news, it looks like everyone is at each other's throat and no, but nothing gets done. But on this issue, it's been extremely productive on both sides, uh, 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 both political parties, uh, both houses of Congress have actually asked very substantive questions. They have requested all kinds of information. And the other part about this compared to other countries is that our discussion's transparent. So when you, um, if you're going to have a, a discussion, you, where, in few other places in the world can you go to, for example, the Federal Trade Commission website, and everybody who's participated in one of their requests for comment, you can see what they said, what is the entity, it's posted. Um, these privacy rules in Europe, they actually allow people to mask their identity. So organizations and people can influence the policy process, and we have no idea who they are, and their comments are not even public. So I think it's... Part of our value proposition is we have a competition of ideas on privacy, and that makes for better policy because we're engaging um, on these different uh, approaches, what are the pros and cons about them, looking at the impacts, understanding who's making the argument, what organization, what are they motivations to do so. So that itself, that policy, that is the process is superior and actually can deliver a superior result. Um, yeah. Thanks. It's, a, it's an honor to, uh, to be on this panel with uh, good friends and uh, very uh, distinguished policy uh, thinkers and leaders, so thank you for including me on the panel, Tom, uh, and uh, giving me an opportunity to answer the question of whether we need federal privacy legislation. I think the answer is yes, yes, because competitive politics abhors a vacuum. And we have a bit of a vacuum, uh, and I think the United States and the type of policy thinking and um, a, a greater, more sophisticated focus on consumer welfare uh, has been disserved by a, a lower level of U.S. federal leadership on privacy issues. And uh, that vacuum uh, 
has been filled uh, very um, fully uh, by Europe and the EU and the GDPR, and now by EU Light, California, uh, the CCPA. Um, and uh, I think we've, as, as a result of which, uh, we, we're at risk. We're at risk of uh, inhibiting or sacrificing the innovation that's really been the hallmark uh, uh, of, uh, you know, one, the U.S. economy, and two, especially the, the digital economy. Uh, stealing some statistics from a recent report put out by uh, ITIF, uh, very impressive uh, report. Uh, I was struck that the, of the 15 largest digital companies uh, identified in that report, uh, all of them are American or Chinese, and of the top 200 digital companies, largest digital companies, um, I think it's, uh, it's uh, all but eight are, I mean, there are only eight European companies. So, I mean, that, that says something. So I think we, we need uh, federal legislation in order to avoid uh, doing harm. Uh, uh, to our, our privacy realm, our, our digital uh, innovation. I think the type of thinking, and I'll let Gail speak for, for herself and the administration, of course, uh, directly, but I would commend the request for comments that the NTIA put out uh, focusing on privacy uh, you know, outcomes rather than prescriptive measures, which is certainly where the GDPR is. Um, and um, uh, I think that even though our uh, existing sector-specific realm makes a lot of sense, and uh, you know, uh, under the leadership of Maureen and, and others at the FTC, the, the really a very thoughtful approach to, to targeting um, uh, abuses, uh, we we don't necessarily want to throw out the whole uh, the whole system we have. One, because it would be very highly disruptive to do so in some areas. Uh, uh, you know, uh, healthcare and, and financial kind of companies, industry sectors know what they're doing there. I mean, that isn't to say that the regimes are ideal, but maybe, uh, it, it, you know, reconsidering whether there are regulatory burdens that are unnecessary there. But um, I think in order to uh, address California, Europe, and to uh, exhibit uh, leadership, uh, we should have federal legislation. There seems to be the zeitgeist has changed for a number of factors, and it's not really a partisan partisan issue. Chris Wolf and I wrote a piece in the Hill where we said, uh, you know, even with a divided Congress now, privacy legislation is not inherently a highly partisan issue. That's not to say if you've got a ranch, I wouldn't bet it on uh, legislation occurring. But um, it isn't necessarily for, for partisan or ideological reasons that it won't happen. And I think for the for the reasons of, of uh, kind of coordination and doing no harm, there, there ought to be a, a federal Federal model. Well, let me just before we get to Gail. So, uh, you said that we're ahead of Europe in innovation, and we've we've gotten all these all these innovative companies. So, the logical conclusion of that doesn't seem to be that we should somehow follow Europe. In well, terms of I, I, absolutely. I think you know maybe we'll have an opportunity later to talk about you know what what we should do. But I think that. We will inevitably follow Europe and be a follower of Europe if we don't have our own model to, uh, to advance, to advocate, to rally around in some sense. Uh, I've long been a proponent that there ought to be a federal policy coordinator on privacy at, uh, in, a, in a manner to, to bring together the administration and to, uh, to be a proponent of, an exponent of the U.S. model, which I think is a heck of a lot better than it's been given credit for, especially in Europe. And the absence of that type of coordination and, uh, and uh, advocacy has resulted in the GDPR taking root not only, obviously, in the however many member states there are today in Europe, I don't know if it's 28 or 27, but, uh, uh, but in the rest of the world and in California. And people think that a, a really prescriptive model uh, that, uh, you know, is, is the way to go to protect privacy without thinking about it carefully enough. So more thought. I would hope that we do have a fa – I'm not advocating a thoughtless federal model of legislation, but rather a thoughtful one. So, Gail, I think uh, probably all these people are here to hear, hear what you have to say. So. <laughs> 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 not to put too much pressure you on you. better make it good, right? Um, so look, the, I, my, the, the question being, do, do we need federal privacy legislation? Um, short answer, yes. 
agree with everything these wonderful panelists um, have said, and I have learned so much from um, talking to them throughout this sort of conversation we've been having for the best part of a year now. Um, and so, so coming from the NEC, there's a little clue in there that economic piece is real important, at least to my boss. And so when I talk about it internally, it's as you know, the question is, is what sound economic policy, right, at the highest level um, on this issue? And so that kind of brings me to three points. It's like the three-legged stool. So so thing number one, and, and of course the other panelists have made this point already, is, um, you know, Calif California's happened. It's the thing in the world. Um, and, and Alan made the observation that, you know, we can either De define what it is we we want at a federal level or be defined, right? And so, um, and, and the other point about California from an economic policy standpoint, and again, the others have alluded to this, is um, it's, you know, we're gonna have a, a patchwork. We have the fifth biggest economy in the world, not just in the, in the country, um, defining privacy, baseline privacy, and there's an emerging patchwork. And my understanding from people who know far more about these things at the state level than I do is that we've got between 15 and 20 bills in cycle. They won't all become laws, but that's an emerging patchwork. And then, of course, there will be states in the United States who will say, from a competitive standpoint, we choose not to go there. But it's still a patchwork, right? <coughs> and the companies are going to have to comply with that at some point in time. <coughs> January um, 2020 was the firmest date we have because that's when California comes into force. So that's thing number one from an economic policy standpoint. And then thing number two is, and this is, um, where when we started our interagency process back in May of last year, um, we're looking around the corner, and of course California happens the next month, um, but really in some ways it came to us from the international facing parts of the interagency, which is not intuitive, but it was from the colleagues at the State Department, ITA at Commerce, and so on, who are in discussions about data flows and interoperability between privacy regimes, who were seeing a, um, a, a material difference in their conversations um, pre and post GDPR. And, and a lot of third party countries were coming to the interagency colleagues and sort of asking where the US was on this issue. They were looking for leadership. That's the, not the only reason to do it, but of course data flows hiding in plain sight are very, very valuable economic tools in, in the digital economy, very important. Um, Alan, you lived through the Privacy Shield, Maureen, and, and so we all know from personal experience just you know how important that whole episode was from a learning standpoint. Um, and so very, very important for our economy um, that we, um, we're, we're fully engaged in these conversations uh, internationally. And so, so that was thing number two. Um, and, and, and fed into the interagency process that we set up. And then thing number three is, is um, you know, consumer protection policy is economic policy at the highest level. And so it's, um, you know, it's, it's apparent to everybody in the past year, and I don't want to make it about one company, I think it's more than one company, but there is, um, let's say, a diminished consumer trust in some of these technologies, okay, without calling anybody out. And so that does, that does tend to suggest that we need to think about this as um, consumer protection policy that then feeds into sound economic policy. So that's kind of where we're coming from. And of course, California, I know for the companies at least, was a real game changer and it changed the conversation from, you know, what can we be doing within the executive branch? How can we show some thought leadership here to um, let's go to Congress? Let's, let's start this conversation with Congress, and I think that's that's where things have landed. And so we've indicated that you know, we will we, we will work constructively with Congress. We've visited with several offices, and we, we expect to visit with some more. And they're asking questions. In the meantime, we have um, after the shutdown, um, you know, we have our NTIA colleagues who have a docket now with over 200 very very thoughtful comments in the docket um, in response to the request for comments that they put out last fall. And I think that's a really um, useful docket. They're going to turn that into um, a roadmap of, you know, the sort of what, what feedback came back from, from all stakeholders. Because to, to, to Roz's point, we set up a very transparent process by design and invited comments from throughout the economy and consumer groups and so on. Um, and we hope to give more guidance both to Congress but, but all the stakeholders as to what we think um, good, good economic policy looks like in this area. In, in, in once the, the shutdown, knock on wood, comes to a close, <laughs> and we get them back, back to work. So, um, I think what I hear, at least, at least two of you saying, and maybe, maybe more, is that we are, 
severely constrained by what has happened in Europe and California in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of our options. Um, maybe if those things if those things hadn't happened, we might it might be the best the best policy might be to do nothing. I, I, obviously, you didn't say that, but that's. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll put that out. You don't. You can disagree, but let's. But we're severely constrained. So that. So the question that arises from that is. So our 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 current approach, as as enforced by the, uh, the by the FTC, is you know is this. And Maureen has written a lot about this. And is this ex post ex post enforcement that is based on actual privacy harms in contrast to the approach that is that is reflected in the European and California. Uh, approaches, which is more of the the ex ante um, uh, approach aimed at hypothetical harms. So, given what you all have said about Europe and California, does that mean that if we if we want to somehow be you know consistent with them, we have to we have to shift our approach in that direction? And is that a good idea? One of the things that I think is overlooked about the ex post case by case approach that the FTC has pursued is that it does give prospective guidance to others in the market, right? To say, be sure you consider these things. Be sure you, you know, take the right the right precautions. Um, the and people might say, well, but you know, you have to wait till there's a violation before you get this guidance. The FTC has given lots of guidance through reports and some guidelines and workshops and speech, you know, so there, there is some guidance out there. I think one of the, the benefits of the case-by-case -case approach that's overlooked, um, and a statute could be drafted this way too, though, is the flexibility, right? If you had set out a number of years ago to write some very prescriptive privacy rule, you probably would have gotten some parts really wrong uh, and missed other problems. So. That is one of the benefits of the FTC's more harms-based approach, and it, it's not that it has to have it. Ha its causes are likely to cause substantial injury, so it's not that you have to have someone you know actually you know hit by a car before you can say you know <laughs> um, you know be careful. Um, and, and also, uh, if a company deceives consumers, that is the harm in itself, right? I think that's also been overlooked. If a company makes a promise to a consumer and that promise isn't fulfilled, that is the harm that can be that can be addressed. So, um, so just to say, I think a statute, if drafted carefully, could get some of the benefits that the FTC's case by case enforcement approach has provided. But it wouldn't need to be drawn carefully to be flexible enough. We, Alan talked about you know all the American companies sort of being out on the forefront. Um, I think there's a reason for that. I think they've been able to innovate in a, an area that wasn't too restrictive. Are there, have there been some problems? Yes, there's been a lot of enforcement against a variety of companies. Um, but I think a statute, it, it would need to get that kind of careful balance. So you think, there was a, I don't want to put words in your mouth, you think it would be possible, and I was going to ask this question of everybody, to draft a statute that roughly maintains the harms-based um, ex post enforcement approach. I mean, is, is that possible to, to do that in a in a statute and 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 also you know achieve the objective of being more consistent with the rest of the world? Well, I, we certainly <laughs> better hope so. Uh, and this is why, again, I, I point back to the request for comments uh, at NTIA, which is very much. Uh, focused on what uh, you know, some of us uh, old uh, OMB cost-benefit analysis uh, people uh, viewed as uh, you know performance or outcome stand. You call it uh, outcome stand. You know, out the results, not the design standards or the engineering standards or the prescriptive uh, approach. Uh, and the the U.S. I mean, our uh, you know enforcement system, a regulatory system, really is focused on identifying harms and only acting where there are abuses. And it really has. I mean, the enforcement model, FTC and other agencies as well. I mean, uh, while they would never 
quite say it. It is the envy of the Europeans. They hope to achieve a similar accountability and enforcement uh, with even more draconian uh, penalties. But the fact of the matter is that our enforcement model uh, is pretty clear. It does provide guidance, uh, and it is a, a, been a quite uh, effective deterrent. Um, and um, uh, so, so I think one of the factors that I think is is really important in designing new policy federal legislation is to have a clear sense of what we're trying to protect consumers against, right? And I think. Uh, I believe that uh, many of the companies that have supported uh, privacy le uh, legislation would, would certainly agree that there are circumstances in which intangible injuries are, uh, are injuries that consumers should be protected against, uh, not just tangible or pecuniary. This was the Supreme Court addressed this in the Spokio decision a couple of years ago. It's been the subject of a lot of standing litigation, you know, as a, as a practicing lawyer and litigator, uh, you know, I, I focus on that. Maureen, uh, as acting chair of the FTC, uh, you know, spearheaded an effort on understanding uh, informational injuries. And I had the chance working with the U.S. Chamber um, Institute for, for Legal Reform to submit comments uh, to the FTC for its upcoming hearings on, on kind of framing what injuries uh, should be actionable. But, you know, one important distinction, it seems to me, between us and the Europeans is that it's all theory. It's too much focused in the abstract and theory in Europe. I had a, a debate with Max Schrems, who, uh, uh, you know, if you follow Privacy Shield, you, you, know, you know who Max Schrems is, and he's been a very inordinately successful uh, uh, litigator against uh, U.S. tech companies. And in pr preparing for our debate, you know, I, I talked about the importance of, uh, of understanding what, you know, consumer behavior, what do consumers really seem to uh, be bothered by, what are their actual concerns. And I think, um, you know, uh, he, he, he sort of dismissed that. And I think it really is important that if Congress is going to act and the administration is going to propose legislation, that we really have a, a, a good sense of what uh, bothers people. What are they concerned about? Yes. What should they be concerned about? Okay. So, uh, but, but what really does seem to, to bother them? And I think that the FTC's cost-benefit test in, in uh, the uh, unfairness standard in, in its statute, which talks about substantial injury that can't reasonably av be avoided, that isn't outweighed by countervailing uh, benefits, you know, that's the type of, of thinking. W one last point, which is, uh, you know, on the ex ante versus, versus uh, ex post uh, uh, enforcement, is transparency. I think there is a consensus that uh, promoting transparency in practices uh, is beneficial because, you know, if consumers don't know what's going on, then, you know, then maybe one, one might say, you know, they, they don't know what they uh, don't know. Um, so, so that really is a factor. And with, as increasing amounts of practices are really invisible to consumers, I think we need to think about that. So, well, speaking of, of Cost-benefit, cost uh, uh, I'm, I'm also an alum of, uh, of OMB. So the question, I mean, the, the obvious question I come to is, is what, and this might drill down into, it obviously drills down into details of what a new law would look like, but what, what, what could a new law look like that would produce net benefits relative to the status quo? So... <coughs> I want to preface this by saying, you know, I, I'm fortunate. I, I work in a department at a, a Danish university where we actually study privacy and security technologies. And interestingly, the Europeans have produced a, a number of interesting research in this area, which was completely absent in the actual uh, outcome of GDPR. It was totally ignored, unfortunately. But it's worth it to look at what it says when we think about cost benefit. Because when we talk about any kind of uh, data protection, data privacy, it's not just one set of regulations. It's a function of a lot of things. And this can make the cost-benefit challenging, but it's certain we can identify what we need to include if we want to do cost-benefit analysis. But trust in an economy, uh, in a system, it's made up of four things. It's the knowledge of the users. It's the level and type of technology. It is the uh, types of business practices. And it's the prevailing institutions. Now, if we look at um, GDPR in California, which I actually call California GDPR heavy, because it has about <laughs> 77 regulations on business, whereas GDPR has only 45. 
But the problem with California and Europe is that they only focus on the, uh, the two of the four inputs. They only focus on business practices and regulation. They completely ignore what's most important, which is the, the knowledge of the user and the types of technologies they use. And if I could propose anything about our policy is we have to focus on people themselves and not consumers as some monolithic group, but individuals who have very different proclivities, they have different preferences, they change over time, they change moment to moment by age and so forth. So our, the policies that are, what we, what we really need is something meaningful that allows a place to have uh, education as a part of, uh, of informing consumers, helping them to develop responsibilities about how they use online systems. I mean, we take licenses to drive a car, to use a certain, you know, we, we have processes for how we educate ourselves. And we look at other parts of the economy where we consume things, there's much more education around health, around finance, and we just don't have that for the internet. And uh, I will say the FTC does an amazing job in terms of children. If you go to their website, it's a fabulous section. And I would say adults, just do everything that you're supposed to do for your kids. And, and we just assume that people know what the right, how they will protect themselves online. Um, they don't know. And in some cases, the companies didn't want to demystify their systems. They like the idea that it's a black box and you set it, forget it. But we. Individuals have to develop a certain sense of responsibility about the services they use and so forth. Uh, the other side of it is our policy has to support um, bottom-up ways to incentivize uh, technologies. And in so that case, safe harbors uh, in the sense that you can try you can try and fail and that we're not going to punish a company because they are want to deploy a new kind of technology. A um, wonderful book you can read is uh, Privacy on the Ground by Bamberger Mulligan, where they, they show that the regimes that are principles-based rather than compliance-oriented, you get much more innovation in privacy-enhancing technologies. And so where I think that the EU has a misstep is that they want to mandate uh, a, a technology X or system X or this, where you actually would want to have a multiplicity of ideas depending upon what you want to do. For example, you, data minimization is maybe not what you want if you're dealing with health. You want to, if you are going to do some kind of cancer therapy, you'd want a system that can incorporate all the possible data points that could be necessary. So having a purpose specification at the front or minimization requirement, when you don't know what's important, you might need to collect a lot of data and you should want that. So we shouldn't unnecessarily constrain uh, uh, companies. So what I would say is if we want to do cost benefit, Tom, we need to look at not just the specific regulations and the institutions. We have to allow for systems that can understand the dynamism of users, their diversity, and then also a way that we have incentives to uh, encourage and not punish companies for trying privacy enhancing technologies. I, no, to just, um, just to, to agree with, um, shockingly, um, everything that the others have said, but you know, just at the highest level here, um, the, the balance is it's, it's privacy and it's innovation, or as, as my boss Larry Kudlow likes to call it, privacy and prosperity, which I love using, <laughs> and makes him happy. Um, <laughs> very important. Um, but but no, it's so it's it's a, it's the it's the menu. It's all of the above. And but going back to um, Ross's point about um, emp empowering consumers, I think that's a really important part of the conversation that we sh we should be having at this point because we have the luxury of time and being able to think big thoughts. Um, and also the um, the role of the FTC, and, and I, having spent 10 years there, I fully concur with what Maureen is saying, which is they were doing a fine job. Um, but that, that's been misunderstood. Um, and and, and so, so let's codify what they're already doing in some places um, and then strengthen the role. And, and, and one way to do that would be sort of civil penalties for the first violation. I think there's like a, violent agreement around that and you only have to look at the docket at NTIA we have 200 comments and I think pretty much everyone agrees on that um, and so so and then these will all um, feed back to create stronger incentives for company to companies to to be more co compliant to be more um, focused on privacy by design and so on because strengthened enforcement will create those incentives one flows to the other and so what a statute might look like, I would point to, uh, while it's you know, not a perfect substitute, if you look back to the Fair Credit Reporting Act, 
and the balances that that struck to give consumers um, transparency, insight, the ability to challenge and correct data that's being used about them for imp important decisions that could have a substantial impact on them. Um, and if you go, actually I actually have a law review article on this, if you go back to the, which Gail claims she read, so. <laughs> <laughs> Kudos to Gail. I, <laughs> I can count one person now, I know. But anyway, um, when you go back to the debates about the Fair Credit Reporting Act, they are, you, you could take them and you could put them into today's terms. It's people saying, there's all this information about me and it's in computers and it's being used in ways I don't understand and it might hurt me. So, um, so I would at least look to how that statute struck the balance and struck it pretty well and has allowed a lot of dynamism and innovation in the U.S. in lending markets, in credit, and, and things like that. So there, it can, it, it's, it's hard, but it's not, it's not impossible. And if you look at the FCRA to get a little bit of a model, I think that might be useful. The, um, uh, you mentioned, somebody mentioned penalties, uh, and that's a big, that's a big thing, I mean, Every time Richard Blumenthal gets uh, on TV to discuss this issues, he said companies have to be penalized. Well, the fact is, you know, I mean, if you look at, at uh, the behavior of stock prices after any of these episodes, uh, companies are penalized far more severely than they would be by, I think, any, any type of penalties that people are talking about putting in statute. I mean, Facebook's Facebook's uh, share value went down 13% after the New York Times article in December, and it's not clear that any consumers were harmed by the practices that were described. So I guess this really gets gets to part of my point is, is there a market failure, or, or, or do, do firms not have, through the stock market really, sufficient incentive, maybe in some cases more than sufficient in incentive, to invest in avoiding these incidents. Um, so, Tom, I want to pick up on on your point there because we were talking about costs and benefits, and, and you're right. I think if by using the GDPR's penalty standard, this the stock loss suffered by Facebook is about 80 times what the penalty would have been paid. And and the other qu issue is it may be two years before a penalty is even assessed on Facebook given the length of time it will take to adjudicate. And then, you know, obviously these things will be fought in court. So even if you adopt, you know, so-called so framework, um, things can take time. I mean, if you take a European approach, it, it can take time to have, a, have an impact. So, uh, you know, in terms of the enforcement, and again, enforcement is never neutral, it's politicized. But, uh, there is a value in the GDPR that we can study the past months that it's been on the books. And you know, I'm going to make a plug. I have a paper out with the Federalist Society where I account for these things. But in terms of harms that we can measure to date in the costs, it's not just costs in the marketplace, but the cost of compliance. And so less than half of applicable firms are compliant with GDPR today. 20% of the firms say they'll never be compliant. Um, I think that on order of though the, the expenses that come that medium to large size companies have had to had to um, to, to expend to comply it's, it's two to three times what they expected I think it, we're on track for a nine billion dollar compliance cost um, so what does that mean I mean you know maybe people we don't worry about oh, Google and Facebook they can of course afford those things and but who can't so thousands of small medium sized firms have stopped serving the EU I mean, I, I sit in Copenhagen. I cannot read um, LA Times online. I can't order on Williams Sonoma. I can't check out recipes online because those companies said, "Look, it's not worth it to us. We're not going to serve the European Union. It's too, uh, it, it's it's too expensive." But it's not just American firms. It's European firms. Uh, the ad tech market by European ad tech firms is down 30 percent, and uh, um, the other part is that even in the decade of these kind of rules. It hasn't meaningfully made consumers more trustful. So uh, only about one third of Europeans even shop outside their own country. So even with all these rules, they don't feel that it's more safe. And when you have now, um, uh, there's now a blocker you can put on your mobile phone to stop all the GDPR disclosures because it's just driving yes. people crazy. Yes. That, you know, it, it's, it's, you, you kind of, it's note to regulator, maybe it's too much disclosure. But the, uh, but the point of that is, um, 
that uh, now some people can say maybe this is a trade barrier because we want to reduce the amount of firms in the market, right? It's so that only European firms would succeed, you know. But uh, I think the end result of all of this, what we can see so far, Tom, is that the market shares of the largest American firms have increased. So Google, Amazon, Facebook actually have a higher market share today than they did. <laughs> Um, when the GDPR came into place because of small firms which have reduced or exited the market. You know, in the, in, uh, the balance, Rosalind talks about uh, a, ba you know, uh, a balance and uh, also the different differential impact on uh, the, the large uh, U.S. firms um, and, and the, the balance on, you know, small and medium-sized businesses. One of the realities that also needs to be taken into account and, and balanced uh, thoughtfully, I don't, I don't have the answer, but I alluded to the fact that a lot of the digital practices uh, are invisible to, to uh, consumers. In other words, uh, a consumer knows if he or she has a contract or is in privity with or is a user of kind of a big company. But one of the things that uh, we, we're all very conscious of now is that the the ecosystem has, an, and Rosalind mentions the ad tech uh, companies and so on, but that really there are so many players with uh, so much going on, all to the great benefit, convenience, innovation, lower prices for all of us, but it's not entirely clear that we understand, uh, you know, uh, there's some geniuses, no doubt, who understand it all. Um, but, you know, in, in thinking about uh, the visibility of practices, transparency, level playing field, um, somehow that needs to be considered. And I don't have the answer. I'm just saying that this is a factor that if we're just looking at the big U.S. tech companies, uh, the, they're certainly in the crosshairs of the Euro uh, Europeans. And, but as, as Rosalind, I think, very astutely points out, in some sense they've been beneficiaries of the burdens imposed by the GDPR on businesses who find it not worth it. So um, I really don't have an answer here, but only that the ecosystem is pretty complicated and uh, some of the relevant practices are, uh, op uh, you know, opaque to, to consumers and maybe even to, to uh, people who are fairly knowledgeable in the field. It's just so, that complicated. So do you think, do you think um, I mean, it is complicated, and I think, I think the evidence shows, at least the, the way consumers behave, that they don't really want to spend a lot of time reading uh, notices and uh, learning exactly, you know, and, 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 and a lot of it is, uh, D too complicated for anybody but real experts to understand. But do you think that the companies have been negligent in not explaining to, to business writers, to, be, to, 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 to journalists, uh, to consumers generally, that they do use data to make money? It's not a, it's not, it's, it's not a, it's not a dirty practice. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually uh, helping consumers. Mm -hmm. But they all act like, or many of them act like, you know, we really can't talk about this. This is. Uh, at least a polite company, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I think that that failure of transparency has has hurt the uh, consumer trust. I think that that everyone has spoken uh, about that is important to, to the economy. And in some cases, the explanations, if provided, would sound uh, not only innocent but would sound, as you say, uh, pr productive. When you listen to some of the the recent congressional hearings, uh, you know, in the summer and and in the fall, it was quite apparent that uh, such transparency as there's been has not made an impact on, on many of the members of Congress who are asking the questions. They seem not really to understand uh, what's going on. And uh, it might be not only is, you know, sunshine a great disinfectant, as has been said, uh, you know, is a deterrent of bad practices, but here transparency might in many ways be reassuring, okay? This is the way it works and we're not, this is all Legitimate. I mean, mo you know, mostly these are legitimate companies engaging engaging in reasonable commercial practices. I mean, I don't want to be uh, you know, uh, is uh, just un uh, naive about this. But for the most part, the practices are benign and productive and beneficial to to consumers. So explanation could be helpful uh, to to business and consumer trust, not just to uh, discipline and and uh, enforcement. So. You know, I have a particular view on this, given, you know, I was looking at the regulatory history about, well, why have we been in this situation today where we have this sense, we talk about these tech giants and the oligopoly and the advertising market, and that's really a big part of it. And, and so, you know, in, in many respects, I think one of the key problems that we have is that we systematically deterred the advertising competition that was attempted to be brought forth by the ISPs. The ISPs for a long time have wanted to 
provide uh, advertising subsidized broadband. That would be extremely valuable uh, to consumers who think that they pay too much for their mobile service or their broadband, and they could have the third party or the internet companies themselves would actually participate. So this is an instance where the sort of the the um, drumbeat, which has been net neutrality, you can only have the consumer must pay the full cost of broadband, and the internet companies themselves cannot pay, third parties can't pay. We artificially reduce the competition in the advertising market. So. That has had real impacts in the sense if you look at any other consumer product when you go online, if you want to buy um, electronics, there's an extremely diverse, robust discussion funded by advertising. And so when you just have a few platform companies, they're not interested to advertise for the discussion themselves because there's just a few of them. But one of the issues here, and myself, I had a career in online advertising before coming into academe, was that I knew that um, I only had to get my customers their ads in one or two networks, and they were happy. They weren't, in, you know, they didn't have to go to ask and all these other things. So we actually need a fundamental disruptive advertising alternative that could potentially be brought by the ISPs or another uh, an, another um, industry. Or and those kinds of bottom-up capabilities were deterred because of the regulatory approach we had in the past 10 to 20 years, which basically said we're going to tamp down one industry in favor of another. Other. And that has been harming the dynamic competition that we actually need in this marketplace. So, so part of the discussion that um, we, we had at the very start of the interagency process was um, around this, this very issue, which is um, if we're talking about end states here, and, and, and thank you, Alan, because you picked up on that. That was like a really important part of what we were trying to convey. Um, no, and absolutely one of the end states is that as we t have this conversation about privacy and if there is resulting legislation, the, the end state cannot be to build a regulatory mode around ex existing incumbents because um, we have to let that competition it thrive and, and not stand in the way of it. Um, and it's been really interesting to watch that discussion play out at the FTC because of course they have that dual mission. Um, and while the privacy conversation has been robust, and I'm sure there'll be more of it, the commissioners have been very quick to point out that um, it's, it's fine to talk about privacy, but we also need to be very mindful that we have a, an important role as competition advocates, and so we can advocate for privacy policy that would stand in the way of that and, and build a regulatory mode. I'll get to the audience quickly, but let me ask one or, just one, one or two more questions. I assume that, that, that people think that a, a federal law that does not preempt the states is basically a non-starter, or am I wrong on that? Well, I'm no. not going to weigh in no. on that, but I will say there's two types of preemption, right? So you can have, like for example, looking back at other FTC things that have worked pretty well is you allow the states to enforce at the federal standard. Right, so mm -hmm. the state can't come up with its own standard, but it can enforce basically what the federal standard is. So that may be one way to kind of allow the states to be enforcers in this space, but have a uniform approach. And that's been the way it is with antitrust for, for years. Yeah. And so you have dual enforcement in cases where you have local markets that might be particularly impacted. Retail is often a good candidate. Hospital mergers, right. the state AGs will join forces with the FTC in investigations and subsequent enforcement actions. I mean, the, the internet and the digital realm is inherently, you know, non-territorial, uh, certainly national. I mean, this, if there were ever an area where, uh, in addition to the ones that have been mentioned, uh, antitrust and uh, uh, certain intellectual property and so on, uh, that uh, there, you know, it, it, a, having a balkanized uh, regime. I mean, you know, I guess it worked for data breach notification. Uh, like, you know, people have different views whether the 50 states, with their different standards, have done anything other than uh, complicate uh, compliance and, and divert resources. But with regard to uh, standards regarding a collection and use of data, I mean, it, it, for one state uh, to assert a jurisdiction is inherently uh, unduly burdensome on, on other states. And I mean, you, one might say that, you know, California, I think Gail said it's a fifth of the uh, world, uh, fifth largest economy in the world. I guess, you know, they, 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 you know they're the eight million pound uh, gorilla, I guess. But 
why should California set the, the standard uh, for, for the whole country? And by the way, you know, before the California law was passed, and it includes, California law includes a preemption provision for municipal privacy laws, because San Francisco was on the road to doing that. And by the way, Chicago is as well. And we see lots of privacy laws uh, sprouting up. I mean, they're proliferating. So it's not just going to be Cal California. So I, I think, I mean, you know, I think a, a federal law that isn't preemptive should be a non-starter, but th that is uh, likely I, I to some, prompt I, some debate. I, I know that there will be debate about it, yes. Um, obviously from the states and, and from obviously some, some people who think that a federal law should be a, a floor and not a ceiling. But, um, but let's say, and this will be my last question, I'll go to the audience. But given the fact that we, uh, as far as I know, cannot preempt Europe, um, <laughs> the, uh, what, so let's say we did preempt the states, but how much of the problem would remain in terms of you know, inconsistent international standards having an effect on? Well, you know, I, I, th there should be harmonization uh, internationally. Uh, I think that that should be a goal of, of U.S. Uh, policy. And uh, I, I mentioned before uh, my view that our, our national policy has suffered for the, for the lack of a clear, you know, uh, a coordinator, policy coordinator, uh, you know, at the, uh, in, the, um, in the federal, uh, you know, in the executive branch. I think we have suffered, especially internationally, in not having somebody who would be uh, able to, uh, you know, advocate for the United States, negotiate for the United States uh, effectively, and uh, we we should do that. And it should be. I don't know if it was Roslyn or, uh, or said it was a, a trade issue, and clearly um, there should be trade arguments that are advanced where the objectives are either you know, expressly or, or covertly protectionist in Europe, or whether the impact, you know, under existing trade laws, um, if, if there's an unjustified regulatory standard that's inhibiting trade, digital commerce, let's say in this case, uh, without justification, that can be challenged as a trade matter. There is a privacy carve-out but it's in, in the WTO agreements, but it's not a carve-out that allows unjustified, arbitrary, or discriminatory provisions in Europe. So I think we should very much be thinking uh, in trade terms. And of course, the Trans-Pacific Partnership did have an excellent e-commerce section, as, as does the, the you know, NAFTA 2.0 uh, also in, uh, adopted the, the excellent uh, electronic commerce chapter in the TPP. So, so we have, I mean, the expectation even in Europe, it's not that we would have you know, um, seamless harmonization, it's that we would be interoperable, right? And, and that's a conversation to have yeah. with European partners. But by, by definition, interoperability says you can have competing standards. They just have to interoperate with one another. And that's a judgment call that gets made further down the road. But I mean, I, I, I honestly see it less as a problem. I think this is a great opportunity for us to have this national conversation to talk about this balance. And I'll use it again, privacy and prosperity being the, the load start. Um, and, um, and, and, and yes, you know, we can talk about it as a problem, but I, I think it's, it's, it's a really important opportunity for us um, at this moment in time too. Okay, I'm going to yeah. throw it open to the audience. So whoever, uh, you have to wait for the microphone and you have to s state your, your name and your affiliation and then ask a question. Uh, hi, uh, Brennan Bordelon, uh, reporter with National Journal. Um, I have a question specifically for Ms. Slater uh, on this. Um, so uh, you mentioned uh, bipartisan interest in the privacy, uh, privacy legislation, uh, the meetings you've had with folks on the Hill. Um, that that's all well and good. Uh, at the same time, uh, you, you mentioned that a lot of people consider California to be a floor, not a ceiling. I can tell you in my conversations with Democrats in both chambers, mm -hmm. I haven't heard anyone say anything otherwise. They all mm -hmm. say that a federal privacy bill has to be as strong as California, as prescriptive, if not stronger. Um, the president has obviously made uh, cutting or, or preventing the enactment of new regulations uh, one of the key pillars of his economic policy. Um, I guess leaving aside what the Senate would do if the House was to send over a very aggressive privacy bill, mm -hmm. what would your office do, and, and ultimately what would, would the president sign legislation in order to get rid of a patchwork, mm -hmm. right, of, of state regulations? Would you guys be willing to sign on to a pretty aggressive federal privacy bill? 
just so many hypotheticals. In there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Not here, so I figured I'd. <laughs> no, no, of course. That's why I'm here. So, I mean, what I can say is I wouldn't be here unless this was um, number one, um, a, a, a priority that had support from my adult supervision. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you can assume that there's absolutely a willingness there to be engaged, to be constructive. But I can't go beyond the hypotheticals <laughs> because we're really just talking about, you know, draft legislation and conversations right now. Um, so I'll have to leave it at that. Yeah, if I could ask yeah. one more, actually. Uh, if, I, if I could ask one more, because I think it, it mm. segues into that. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that 2019 could be the year for privacy legislation. Um, this is a very high level discussion we've mm -hmm. had here, right? So, and, and there hasn't really been, there's no text in the Senate, there's no text in the House. Um, industry, from what I understand, doesn't really know what it wants yet. I, I'm not sure even consumer advocates entirely know what they want with a bill. <laughs> what would you guys, what would, the, would you guys anticipate in terms of timeline? I mean, do you think 2019, is that a feasible uh, uh, sort of end game here that we can have a bill passed and signed by the president by the end of this year? Let me extend that before, <laughs> before the next election, let's say. So I'm going to take a moment here to go back to 2012. And I think it's very interesting. You know, the Obama administration proposed, uh, I think it was a, I'm going to forget, was it McCain and Kerry or McCain and Mark? I'm forgetting, no, sorry, McCain and, I'm forgetting who proposed it. But in any case, we're sort Kerry of McCain. at the consensus of where we were in 2012. And I think in some ways that was a short-sighted of the industry that they could have taken that opportunity at that time. And we might not even be, we probably wouldn't be here today. But in many respects, I think there's been a lot of progress. So I'm optimistic. I mean, I know, I guess we have different conversations, but I have actually, when I, I testified on the Hill twice last year um, in two Senate hearings, and I got the most substantive questions from Democrats who are actually legitimately interested in what are the impacts. Everyone's very concerned. They don't want to destroy industry. Um, you know, in California, actually, they don't want to destroy their economy. And I think even whenever um, Mc, Alistair McTaggart, he was even talking about the importance of privacy and prosperity, as, as Gail's boss so elegant, elegantly describes. So I'm actually optimistic, and I think that the job is on us in the policy community to make the case around the cost benefit and that we should look at the evidence. We have a great example of what not to do. And I, I also, I'd like to say, I know California is a one party state, but they're reasonable. And, you know, they, um, so in any case, the, um, I'm optimistic. I'll just put it, put it that way. Uh, I would just say with regard to, uh, you know, text, uh, I, I'm not sure that there's a shortage of legislative text and proposals. Uh, the uh, Future Privacy Forum uh, uh, think tank that uh, Debbie Berlin and I serve on the, on the board, so with that disclosure has put out a kind of a distillation and a matrix of the different proposals that are out there, some of which are uh, introduced legislation. Uh, in the article that I mentioned uh, in the Hill with uh, uh, that I, that I did with Chris Wolf, uh, I noted, and and this goes to the optimism or pessimism, that the the point of that article was that there is a track record for Republicans and Democrats actually co-sponsoring legislation in the privacy arena. Uh, you know, I don't know that uh, past performances. Oh, and by the way, none of them was enacted. But uh, you know, the past performance is any prediction of future results, but. Uh, this could be an area, if there were an area that, besides infrastructure perhaps, that Democrats and Republicans could show some, uh, you know, active, positive, constructive uh, cooperation together, this might be that area. But as I said before, don't bet the ranch if you only have one. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Uh, Maureen Bax from Inside Cyber. Uh, so my question is specifically for Ms. Slater, uh, not surprisingly probably, but um, uh, in the discussion around harm that you had just now, um, I think that Mr. Leonard was talking about the Facebook incident and um, the question arises of whether consumers were actually harmed. I, I, I'm assuming you, you're referring to the Cambridge Analytica um, well, that incident. that I wasn't I would, that could be a good example. I okay. was actually referring to the New York Times article in December, which which is similar to. Well, let's let's yeah. um, I'll I'll rephrase my question um, and make it specific to Cambridge Analytica. Um, would you consider or, or should the Cambridge Analytica violation at Facebook be considered in the legal sense harmful to consumers? So. Um 
see there's another hypothetical in there, because it assumes a violation, and I, I'm not the FTC, and they are an independent agency, and God knows no one respects that more than I do, maybe Maureen does. <laughs> 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 Robert, sorry, Maureen. I think we're but, equal so, respect. So, I mean, we, 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 um, we, we don't get involved in, in their investigations and follow-on enforcement actions. Um, and so, uh, so I, I really, I, I can't answer that question because I don't know enough about the facts and the evidence and how that investigation has come together. Um, I, Maureen, yeah, do you, do so you have me, a Yeah, so let me jump in and yeah. not specific to the Cambridge Analytica mm -hmm. thing, but something that I think the New York Times article really got wrong, which is the idea that if you have made a promise to a consumer and you <coughs> didn't keep that promise, that's harm. You're, you're mm -hmm. done with harm, right? You don't need to show additional harm. So a lot of the FTC enforcement in the privacy space has been for that, you know, to uphold that principle. Consumers, you know, if they're promised that their information is going to be protected in a certain way or not shared or it's only going to be used for, you know, this purpose and they use it for something else, then there is a misrepresentation that a consumer ha has, you know, been subject to. And so I would expect that any privacy bill would bring in, if, if necessary, I mean, this is a basic part of the FTC's uh, existing deception authority. So the harm issue, I think, again, not specific to any case, is when there hasn't been a promise made to consumers, when there's been a collection or a use or a sharing of information that the consumer you know, wasn't told about. And then you have to say, did that cause some kind of, did it cause or was it likely to cause some kind of substantial injury that's not outweighed uh, by benefits and that the consumer could not have reasonably avoided? So the FTC has used that authority for a lot of data breach things, but also things about where real-time location data was collected, um, things, you know, information about children, or like people's medical records were exposed. So I think, you know, we have to understand that if you lied to a consumer, that's a harm. Um, so I'm not going to address Cambridge Analytica per se, but if you use it as a shorthand or, or, or you know, uh, just as a, as a rubric for, uh, you know, foreign Russian interference uh, in, in the election, uh, I would say that, and if you consider uh, uh, consumer, you know, consumers and, and citizens uh, to be uh, assimilated for these purposes, I would say citizens were uh, arguably harmed by being manipulated by disinformation that was foisted uh, on us uh, by, you know, foreign government. And I would go further to say that part of the current uh, perspective uh, in this policy, um, in this policy debate. Uh, in terms of how, you know, legislators and citizens are reacting is the, the observation by citizens, consumers, average people, that by uh, effectively deploying disinformation and scaling it uh, on the Internet that, uh, that, that people have been manipulated. And, uh, you know, whether it affected the outcome of any election uh, is debatable, but, but certainly the effort was there to manipulate. And uh, I think that's, you know, classic deception. But who was the perpetrator? The perpetrator was a foreign nation state. But what it has demonstrated, for, in my view, for uh, the citizenry is that uh, if you weaponize information uh, and you do deceive, there, there can be, uh, you know, there, there can be injury. <clears throat> Uh, Carl Zabo with NetChoice. Uh, first of all, discussions of expensive and uncertainty. When I hear those terms, I tell my law students, gainful employment. So thank you <laughs> for that. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to ask, getting back to one of the questions about details and in the weeds, what federal legislation would look like. We, we mentioned earlier child privacy, and, and we do have COPPA. Would a COPPA-like regime with essentially authorized safe harbors, would a system like that work for federal privacy legislation? You know, I mean, COPPA certainly is one of the more, uh, I would say, dr draconian uh, federal regimes. And now maybe the devil in that, in the detail of your question is the safe harbors. 
but uh, certainly there have been, uh, it, it is an area in which uh, even well-meaning uh, companies uh, can run afoul uh, because of what they're held to, to know uh, in terms of the age uh, of the users and in terms of who's attracted to a website. Uh, and of course, there's also great uh, uh, debate and uncertainty, in, 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 including in legal cases that have come out the other way on whether uh, the personal information, uh, um, you know, well, the FTC has said persistent identifiers under the copper regulation are, is, 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 is covered. So in fact, that's where they've gone out and said that persistent identifiers are personal information, which has precipitated its own debate. But that exists in the <laughs> copper realm under FTC regulation. I, I would think it's maybe on the, on the severe side of uh, a, a way to go. But. but looking at the safe harbor provision specifically, and, and believe you me, I, I file comments against exactly the extensions that you just described. But looking at a safe harbor regime for federal privacy legislation along the lines of what we have today in COPPA. Uh, one, one thing about COPPA as, um, you know, it serves a very limited purpose, right? It puts into the hands of parents the ability to control the collection of personal information about children. Um, I think any privacy law that would be considered would have to be much beyond, you know, not focused simply on, you know, are you collecting information and what, what kind of information. I think it would have to cover uh, use of that information to meet the demand that we're hearing about concerns. Yeah. But I like safe harbors. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, Carl Herkenroder with Com Daily. I had a question for Maureen. Uh, Marco Rubio is introducing a bill that would have the FTC uh, recommending privacy rules for Congress to pass. Do you think that the FTC should be drawing something up? Does that sound like a good idea? Well, the, the, you know, the FTC has a lot of expertise in this area, and I would say, um, in although the commission's recent testimony sort of. Uh, said, yes, we're, we're in favor of privacy law. Congress, you know, make the harder choices about <laughs> some of those policy issues. Um, look, I think any legislation in this area should have FTC input, right, because it's the agency that's brought the cases, that's developed the law here, that I think has a good sense of where some of the difficulties are, particularly for the reason that Gail mentioned. It is also an agency that pays attention to competition. Um, now, as for whether, you know, Congress should direct the FTC to, you know, come up, come up with the statute, I, I don't really have an opinion on that. But I, I would say whatever the process is, it's important to have the FTC be part of it. You know, I, if Congress wants to draw on the FTC expertise in this area, that seems entirely appropriate. But I, I would have great separation of powers concerns under the Constitution if there were federal legislation that mandated the executive branch, even a... Uh, you know, an uh, independent agency to send up legislation because uh, th that encroaches, it seems to me, on the, on the separation of powers. The president and his, uh, in this case, independent agency, uh, they ought to be, be able to decide for, for ar under Article Two of the Constitution whether to send up legislation or not. Good afternoon, my name is Peter Fatelnik. I'm working for the European Union delegation and uh, thank you for all the promotion on GDPR you have done. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, there's no such thing as bad publicity. <laughs> <laughs> but my, 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 my question is a bit, I've, I've heard a lot of sort of looking backward, you know, that maybe there is a problem, let's identify it and then find a solution or fix it. But isn't there also the other side of the timeline, the looking forward thing, given how digital technologies evolve, the speed today, the speed we anticipate for the next 10 years or whatever, that you arrive, uh, let's say, if you look back in 10 years from now, that you say, we have done the right thing, and anticipating a little bit, understanding what citizens want. I is this part of the conversation? That's sort of a bit my question. Well, to take it, just a, one aspect of that is, is, um, is to say, um, yes, look back and look at what's working today, and, and I think there is a lot of consensus, and um, again, I go back to the docket at NTIA, and 
um, around the, the strength that the FTC brings to the table, both as in terms of its policy expertise, but also its in enforcement chops. And so the, the, what seems to be the conversation, the consensus is around strengthening that role, but, but not doing harm to it. Um, so I think that's, that's one aspect of this sort of bigger picture that I would spell out. But you were gonna say, Roz. Uh, so yeah. Peter, thank you for coming. I hope you're, I don't know if you're riding your bike in this weather, but um, <laughs> good for you for bringing your uh, habits. Um, but, but I think one of the ways to understand, there's a huge cultural dimensions here, and I think there's a fascinating literature uh, looking at different privacy rules adopted on a cultural dimension. And one of the things that we can look at uh, for, for many Europeans are more risk averse, and understandably from history after two world wars, uh, so, so people are concerned, sometimes they're concerned about the future. I mean, I'm gonna stereotype here, but Americans, we can be optimistic about the future, and that is kind of part of our DNA of, of the history that we have, and we, we don't always assume the most negative thing will happen. We allow for positive outcomes, and that's, a, that's, that's there. And so, uh, uh, but on the other hand, we do have a lot of things historically because our rules have really reflected the right of the public to know. And I think even in the case of the European Union, what we saw recently with the right to be forgotten, the Attorney General in the EU siding with Google that said, you know, there's too much uh, heavy handedness of even removing research results. So, you know, th these things have a balance, as we said, but there are cultural, there are cultural reasons that uh, different nations choose the paths that, that they have. And, and I think that that's a, that's a good thing. We should talk about why. And, uh, but I would say to anyone is that to look at, um, uh, there, there, it doesn't make one thing empirically right or better. I mean, it's just different reasons why uh, nations may choose the regimes they do. Um, so I think we have, I, would, I think we really have time for one last question and the lady over there had her hand up. Uh. Hi, I'm Irene Zen from Monument Policy Group. And um, as we know, like in like, 2017, the 18 senators, Leahy, Blumenthal, Blackburn, um, the, sorry, um, yeah, and they all right, introduced legislations, like um, correct me if I'm wrong, they're primarily based off the GDPR um, method or t template. And one of the, um, they all include provisions like in the event of a data breach, and if the uh, covered company must inf inform uh, more than 5,000 consumers, they, should o they must also inform major credit reporting um, companies as well. So um, a provision like that would cause um, significant compliance, uh, increased compliance costs. And so if legislations like that get passed today and became law, like in the United States, would you, would you expect that an increase in the compliance costs, what would be the implications to the company's earnings and cash flows? Would it be a major concern to the companies in terms of the earning cash flows? I, I, you know, I don't know the answer to, to that question, but I will note uh, in, in the re with regard to the impact of privacy legislation on, on revenues that there, there's a, uh, one company, uh, uh, Nielsen Rating Company, uh, this was in its public filings, at least as quoted in a complaint that I've read, so I'm not involved in the litigation and I can't attest to the, the accuracy or veracity. But the complaint filed against the company quotes the company's SEC filings, you know, 10K, 10Q, uh, as saying that uh, the company's revenues were substantially affected in a negative way by its uh, le uh, lessened ability to engage in its corporate practice, prior corporate practices because of GDPR. So yeah, I, I have no comment as to whether that's accurate. I'm just saying the complaint quotes the, the uh, public filings as saying that their, their revenue stream was impacted adversely by the GDPR as to whether the, the legislation you're addressing in the U.S. would have similar impacts, I, I don't know. And I don't know that it's actually true of, of, the, of the company that, that uh, I mentioned. I read the complaint. Well, I'd like to thank the panel. It was a great discussion.